<laughs> yes. All right, we're recording. So <laughs> okay. um, we are joined today by Judge Poitras, who is running to retain his seat uh, in the King County Superior Court. And Judge, please, please go ahead with your two minute introduction. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak with you this afternoon. Um, for me, being a judge comes down to service. And one of my earliest memories of serving the community was when my single mother and I helped volunteer to clean up a local strip mall that was looted and burned uh, during the 1992 Los Angeles riots. Um, a deep desire to assist others awoke in me that day. And that desire uh, fueled by my faith has led to a personal commitment to live my life in service of others. And serving as a judge allows me to assist the community in a legal setting where people often turn uh, when uh, they need assistance where all else has failed. Um, Superior Court in particular, are where families turn when things have not gone the way that they, or in some circumstances, the way that society would have hoped, where victims of crime turn for belief and protection from some of the most heinous acts a person can commit against another person, and where people accused of crimes um, and the requirement uh, that due process and constitutional protections are of the utmost importance. And so I desire to serve as a Superior Court judge to assist the community as they confront um, many of the challenges that our society faces today and the unknown challenges that we will face tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, our first question is gonna be asked by Alice and it's in the chat. Okay, <laughs> okay thank you. What are the elements of your background and experience that make you best qualified to earn our endorsement? So um, one of the things that I pride myself on is uh, just a hard work ethic, um, being uh, com compassionate, um, committed to service, um, fairness, and to um, following the law and having a an understanding of the law and continuing to strive to, to improve and to, to work to be better and be a better judge every day. Um, and hopefully the next time I sit before you uh, for an interview, I'll be even better judge than I am today. Um, I've had, I've served as a judge for, or a neutral decision maker full time now for over 14 years. And during that time, I've gained a opportunity to learn and grow as a judge on a near daily basis. Um, and in that time, I've had the opportunity to learn the skills and refine the tools to work with individuals that don't have attorneys, uh, those that need the assistance of interpreters, um, as well as those that are sometimes um, upset and frustrated with the process and with the judicial system. And it's been my, um, my pleasure and honor uh, to be able to serve the community um, as they turn to the court uh, for relief and protection in some circumstances. Thank you. Ethan has the next question and has been posted in the chat. Hi there. Um, in what ways can courts better serve those of moderate or low financial means in civil actions? So unfortunately, the, the biggest, I think, hurdle uh, to, to many ways that courts can help assist is uh, stemmed from funding. Um, it's, you know, whether that's through programs that can, can help um, provide assistance or the even larger uh, area where they can potentially help um, is appointing counsel. Um, as you may know, um, unlike in criminal cases, uh, there is no um, protection or constitutional uh, right uh, to an attorney in civil cases. Um, Washington State, um, I believe, is the first in the nation that does uh, provide a representation for individuals that are facing eviction, um, but um, short of very few um, circumstances like that, um, there's, there's not a, a lot of help um, and the help that is available, there's, there certainly are um, organizations and areas where um, assistance can be provided, but the, the need often outmatches the uh, resources that are available. And so um, if we were able to be provided additional funding, uh, that would go a long way in helping 
uh, provide access to justice, especially for those uh, that are of a low income or no income in some circumstances. Thank you so much. Yep. And we'll go uh, ahead to our third question. Barbara, if you could take this one and it's been posted in the chat. Yes, thank you. Um, if, if presiding over a criminal doc, uh, docket, what role do you think judges should take and would you take, if any, in diverting defendants to diversion programs such as drug court, mental health court, and other um, diversion programs. I think the, uh, the question says division, but I, I'm going to assume that it means diversion programs and other alternatives to incarceration. Thank you. So I think that judges need to be analyzing each case on a case by case basis. Um, and one of the things that uh, judges should be looking at is um, in addition to um, attempting to provide an superior court level um, in a criminal case, um, sentences that comply with the Sentencing Reform Act, um, looking at the, the purposes of those acts. And one, one of those purposes is um, to um, provide um, rehabilitation uh, to uh, those that have been uh, convicted. And so I think that uh, looking uh, for alternatives um, such as drug, drug court or mental, mental health court um, are certainly things that the, that the court should be looking at, that the judge should be looking at in each case. Um, I think the judge also uh, should seek input and be open to hearing input uh, from both sides, um, whether that's the defense or prosecution, and looking at whether or not they, um, in the efforts that they are taking behind the scenes and in, in investigating the case and looking at all the different factors that sometimes the court doesn't um, have access to, um, and should be considering that as well and, and looking at whether or not this person um, is a candidate for potential diversion. Uh, the, I think a lot of the cases um, get diverted out uh, by the prosecutor's office before it ever gets to, um, to me as a judge in a case, but nonetheless, there certainly are things that, uh, like I mentioned earlier, that the court should be looking at. Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome. And Laura has our last and fourth question. Thank you. What is your position on bail reform and what factors do you or would you consider when deciding whether to impose bail and what changes would you advocate for if any, if elected? So <clears throat> I can't take a, a necessarily a public position as it pertains to um, bill reform in light of the fact that that potentially could be an issue that um, could be before me um, in a case um, in, in, in some point in the future. Um, but I can tell you that I closely follow uh, rule 3.2 um, in determining and making any decisions upon a release um, and starting with the presumption of release and working from that presumption and looking at the individual uh, circumstances and alleged facts of each case before me, uh, looking at things like a person's uh, prior uh, criminal history, uh, looking at things uh, such as a person's prior appearance rate uh, for court and using those things to help guide my decision and walk through uh, some of the steps uh, that I'm required to analyze under Rule 3.2. And ultimately, uh, the decision on what conditions um, to impose uh, pre-sentence um, relate to um, the, fault, the analysis under that rule and looking at whether or not a person is, uh, for instance, likely to appear um, at future court dates or whether they're flight risk, um, looking at uh, whether or not that person is uh, likely to commit a violent offense um, and or interfere with the administration of justice, for example. And so those are the things that I'm looking at uh, to determine if I need to move from that initial presumption of release. Thank you so much. So that is our four prepared questions. We will now open it up to the executive board 
for questions and these responses just to remind you are one minute responses. Does anyone have a question? And I have a question and uh, <laughs> I'll just jump into the question and then we'll see if other questions come. Um, so this is a question about restorative justice um, that we have answered, we've asked um, in another context to some judicial questions, but candidates, but how would you kind of define restorative justice and to what extent are you committed to incorporating the principles of restorative justice in, in your job and, and kind of the decisions you make? So restorative justice, and I'm not sure if this is necessarily a textbook de definition, but uh, to me, it invokes concepts of bringing in uh, the larger community um, and looking at um, when a person is accused of a crime, um, in most cases, um, looking at bringing in the alleged victim of that crime and other members of, of the community and seeing what, if anything, can be done to address um, and provide um, accountability and responsibility uh, for the allegations, but also looking at um, how that can, how the community can be um, healed uh, from the, the harm that occurred and, and what steps can hopefully be taken to prevent a similar outcome. I have a question. Um, yes. What uh, of the rotations on the um, Superior Court, um, kind of in the Superior Court wheelhouse, are you um, most interested in uh, sort of taking on? So I don't really have a, a most interesting rotation. I, I'm interested in, in rotating through all of them. I think they all provide their uh, different challenges um, as well as opportunities for, for learning and growth and service. Um, there's you know, family law rotation where you're you know, assisting families as they're uh, working through um, very challenging and emotionally charged issues. Uh, there's juvenile rotation um, where you are um, presiding over uh, cases where uh, youth are accused of crimes. Um, currently, I am on a criminal trial rotation, and I am uh, pretty much every week um, in trial on felony criminal seconds. trials. Okay. And I also do uh, civil cases as well, and it provides a, quite a wide variety of different types of cases. I, I had one uh, one more question, which is, is there anything you'd like us to know about yourself that maybe we haven't had a chance to get to in the interview process? Can I ask a question for clarification? And like in, are you talking about like personally, professionally? Uh, it's if you want to get into question. professional, uh, <laughs> personally, but I was thinking more professionally, but if, you, if there's anything that's re relevant to what we're talking about personally, um, feel free. Um, so I think just in general, um, personally, I touched on this earlier, I have a commitment to uh, constantly improving. And so I am aiming to uh, continue to, to serve the community and to serve you, um, the voting public who you, I work for you. Um, and my aim is to continue to, to improve and to continue to work to refine um, my process and my method um, every day um, so that I can continue to um, be a better judge than I was the day before. And so that's something that I am committed to and working at very hard. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions? Um, I have a question just in general in regards to the backlog of cases due to the pandemic. Uh, what are you doing to ensure that King County addresses that backlog and does so in an equitable manner that furthers access to justice? So we are working hard to make sure that we have all hands on deck. Um, and so that's something that I am 
not necessarily orchestrating, but definitely very much a, a part of um, in terms of doing my best to help out um, as we're all working to attack the, the backlog as best as we can. Um, in addition to that, the court as a whole um, has, in response to the pandemic, um, worked at introducing new um, technologies such as uh, video um, voir dire and um, for some civil trials, uh, video or video trials, remote trials through Zoom through the entire process. And so there's, there's, there's different ways that the court is looking to provide access to justice, but also still providing an opportunity for those that don't have the access to the technology to still participate um, in person. Thank you. Welcome. Are there other questions? What is your approach or what would be your approach to working with um, an unrepresented um, you know, claimant or litigant in your courts? Um, and and what, can the, uh, what can our legal system do to better support those individuals? It'll definitely take more than one minute to answer this question, <laughs> but I'll try to be brief. Uh, patience is where you have to start. And I think that we get better results when there's attorneys on both sides, but for a number of reasons, some of which I've touched on already, that's not always possible. Um, and in certain cases, a person has a right to represent themselves. Um, but there are times when a person is representing themselves, whether that's by choice or by necessity, uh, where they don't understand all of the different rules and customs that we follow and in court. And so it's important to be as patient as possible, to be as clear as possible, to give the opportunity to um, provide a summary of what we're doing in court um, in that particular hearing or that particular day, um, and to give as much opportunity as possible to uh, allow for seconds. questions. Okay. Are there any last questions? All right, please go ahead with your one minute closing. So I wanna thank you again uh, for this opportunity to, to interview with you today. Um, my hope is that I've been able to distinguish myself in a positive way um, based on my over 14 years of experience as a full-time judge or neutral decision maker. And I am to continually improve and serve the community as a judge that is committed to a hard work ethic, um, fairness, um, compassion, and a commitment to service and look forward to continuing to serve you as a Superior Court judge. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Judge Poyjo.